Good morning and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure that mobile phones are on silent and that mobile devices, while they may be used for uh, purposes of social media, are not should not be used for purposes of filming or recording. Uh, we have apologies this morning from Emma Harper and from Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, the first item on our agenda is a declaration of interests. In accordance with uh, Section 3 of the Code of Conduct, I invite David Torrance uh, to declare any interest relevant to the remit of the committee. Thank you, Convener. I have nothing to declare. Thank you very much. In addition, uh, Bob Doris is attending this morning as a substitute for Emma Harper, uh, and may I also invite uh, Bob Doris to declare any interest relevant to the remit of the committee. Uh, good morning, Convener. Nothing to declare. Thank you very much. Can I welcome David Torrance as a new member of the committee and Bob Doris as a substitute member of the committee uh, to today's proceedings. Uh, we move on swiftly to our first uh, uh, evidence session, which is in relation to the Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill. Uh, these sessions will focus on the impact of the bill on the social care sector. Can I welcome to the committee Karen Hedge, National Director of Scottish Care, Alison Christie, uh, Policy and Development Officer Workforce for the Coalition of Care and Support Providers in Scotland, Andrew Strong, uh, Assistant Director, Policy and Communications for the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland, uh, Mark Hazelwood, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Partnership for Palliative Care, and Catherine Wainwright, Head of Human Resources, uh, Turning Point Scotland, representing the Scottish Council for, uh, of, for Voluntary Organisations. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Uh, the uh, procedure, as I'm sure you'll be familiar, is uh, that uh, I'll, I'll kick off the question session. Other colleagues will ask questions, uh, and questions and answers uh, should be through the chair. So can I start by asking uh, all of you a general question around the provisions of the bill and, and whether, uh, if, if you like, the, the issues the bill may be intended to address, and ask whether you believe that staffing in the social care sector currently is adequately covered by the regulation and inspection regimes we have. Who would like to start on that? Karen? Hedge. Hi there. Um, at this precise moment in time, we already have both the policy context and the legislative context to support social care um, staffing within the sector. Um, social care in Scotland's come a long way uh, to begin to create those conditions required for improvement and innovation. Uh, you can see this in the health and social care standards. Um, introduced earlier this year, legislation such as the Self-Directed Support Act and in our practice such as the new methods of inspection um, recently brought in by the Care Inspectorate. I am proud to represent an ever-evolving sector which retains at its heart an asset-based individualised approach to providing care that is grounded in human rights. As human beings in a society, our wants, needs and wishes change. And this means that we need to be able to meet the needs of our older citizens and others who access care and support. We must be flexible to those demands. Um, on top of this, the market itself is ever-changing and we are living longer in terms of austerity. We need to be able to think differently about how care and support is delivered. As the committee will know, the purpose of legislation is to freeze components. Um, and my concerns is that by introducing this bill, it will enshrine the use of tools and statute which could potentially put at risk several things which I can go on to outline later. But at this point in time, the context fits what is required. So, as I say, I'm very keen to understand how far the current regimes operate yeah. and how far they're adequate. Uh, Alison, um, CCPS members um, believe that the current regulations do provide for high quality uh, trained staff to support individuals to achieve their outcomes. We also are aware that the work of the National Health and Social Care Workforce Plan Part 2 is looking to address workforce planning and COSLA and the Scottish Government are progressing the recommendation, recommendation to do just that. We've worked quite closely with the Bill team and had several discussions with them and we've yet to get clarity on what the benefits or added value that the Bill will bring to social services or people using social care. Okay. Andrew? Strong. Yes, um, so our perspective is slightly different from um, other members of the panel. So our response was written um, in conjunction with our individual members 
um, members of the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland to use health and social care services on a, uh, a regular basis. Um, and, uh, and that was a view that we felt was kind of missing from the debate so far around about this bill. Um, and I think, come, come back to the, the question, I think it's important to see that this bill is uh, a means to an end rather than an end in itself. Um, and one of the key things that we heard when we were talking to people was about continuity of care being really critical to them, that they wanted um, staff to be there, uh, that they knew uh, as far as that was, that was possible, um, and that greater consideration of staff and input um, is likely to lead, lead to a greater possibility of achieving that continuity for them. Uh, and as such, many of those people were, were in favour of the bill. Um, but I would add that in, 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 in that consultation with, with our members, uh, we heard experiences of understaffing in health and social care settings, which could be improved on uh, by the, the introduction of appropriate and ambitious tools, but also um, the resources required to make adhering to those tools possible. Um, so that, that's, that's probably just the opening kind of yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, there are obviously really major issues in terms of workforce across the health and social care sector. Um, our view is that they're primarily driven by other issues, um, uh, national workforce planning, um, affordability for commissioners, and wider issues in the labour market affecting recruitment and retention. And the, the, the main issues uh, that there are around workforce, we don't believe, are primarily caused by deficiencies um, in workforce planning at a local level or deficiencies or inadequacies of uh, legislative or regulatory frameworks at the moment. Okay. And Catherine Whitmer. We believe that the plans, policies, legislation, the new health and social care standards and the inspection approach is more than adequate at the moment. We see no particular benefit and see the, uh, the bill is unnecessary. Um, there's not a, a focus in the bill in terms of um, outcomes. Um, that is, I suppose, the way that um, the sector is uh, thinking at the moment. Um, so, in short, we don't believe that it's necessary or required. Thank you very much. Can I just come back to Andrew with your particular perspective on the users of services? Is there... Is it possible to describe a user perspective that it current, as currently exists in, in relation to staffing issues, or is, that, is it so dispersed and varied as not to allow for such a characterisation? Sorry, I'm not quite... Would, would, would your view on behalf of the Alliance be, would there be a user perspective on staffing issues and on how they are being addressed or should be addressed? I mean, uh, th so... so I've Come back to the point, I think people are clear that there has been quite a lot of consultation around about the health and social care standards as well. Uh, and I think there's a lot been going on around about workforce issues, but also about the kind of regular, regulatory framework of the care inspectorate. And I think people are clear that actually that's where, that's what they're expecting from social care services. I think that would be kind of, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say there was necessarily complete understanding of, of, of that. I think there, there's um, differences within our membership about what they think about this bill. Okay. David Stewart. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the panel for the evidence so far? I'm really interested in workforce planning, particularly in the care uh, home sector. Obviously, there's a different context is there. There's private sector, there's local authority, and there's the third sector. Could the panel outline what tools, if any, are used currently for workforce planning in that sector? Yes, please. Hi there. Um, at this point in time, those who use workforce planning tools often use something called the indicator of relative need, or the otherwise known as the iron tool. Um, there were two, uh, two versions of this tool, an earlier version which was created around about 15 years ago, and then a later version. Um, in itself, it served a purpose as guidance, but in current uh, terms of social care thinking, with terms of having an asset-based approach, uh, it doesn't meet those current needs of society, exactly what some of my colleagues in the panel were talking about, that individualised, personalised approach that we need to deliver in social care, in health and social care. Um, so at this point in time, it is mostly around the iron. Would you like me to talk more about yeah, potential? Could, could you just briefly explain it for those that are not sure, familiar it's, um, with it? It asks questions and basically assesses what uh, dependency and need. Um, 
But the, where it's not fit for purpose is around about we need to be thinking about capability yes. and enablement and prevention. So it's not able to take that into account at this point in time. It's also missing what happens overnight as well. So it's not currently fit for purpose. If tools were to be created, they would need to be a two-stage process. Um, and they'd need to be done in such a way that, obviously, all the other concerns that um, myself and my colleagues have with, um, with the bill are taken into account. But it would need to be a two-stage process, firstly around about developing that asset-based model, which can um, assess, for want of a better mm -hmm. word, the, the needs, the outcomes, what a person is able to do, not what their dependency is, as is outlined in um, the Care Inspectorate submission. Um, and there's a wee bit of a concern there because they have, you know, lead responsibility for producing those tills, tools. Um, so we need to think about how that would work better in a, a co-produced way if tools were to go ahead because they need to work for the people that are using them on the ground, otherwise they'll create additional burden. Mm. The second stage of that process would be around about creating a, an algorithm, and I have absolutely no idea how that works, but I'm sure there are experts in digital who would be mm. able to think about that mm. sort of thing. And they would be taking that staffing and skills mix um, and applying that to the asset-based model. Mm. But it's we need to think about it very, very carefully without because we don't want to risk enshrining mm. something that would mm. um, take away and human Presumably, judgment. through your convener, presumably there's a scale issue involved. If you've got very small care homes, it must be much more difficult using this individual very technical tool that you're referring to. Absolutely. I mean, the, the social care sector is very, very diverse. We have, you know, large corporates, we have small individually run providers, um, and my colleagues also represent other providers, for instance, around about drug and alcohol use and so on, um, as, as does Scottish Care, actually. And we need to think about how, how could you apply that tool in different settings, whether or not different tools would be required. There's the training and development required around about all of that. So many different things that need to be thought of if that's the route we choose to go down. Other witnesses wish to add on, on, on those points? Uh, Catherine. Um, as a provider, uh, our two registered care homes are specifically for substance misuse. Um, so I suppose it's just to highlight that, um, not to make assumptions around it being elderly care and the complexities of the individuals with which we're working is, is really, really high. Um, the size of the, the units that we would run are um, 10 and 12 people that would be supported in those units. So they're fairly small in their um, capacity um, and they are supported by um, other services that are provided so um, they don't stand in isolation and there's some enrichment um, and movement of staff and skills between other services around and about so I suppose the other part of that is that care homes don't just stand alone they're part of a greater network within provider units. David, did you have a follow-up? Uh, I suppose the other issue is that for uh, many care home owners, and all of us in this, all the members here will be visiting care homes um, across our, our patches. Um, certainly when, when I've been doing visits uh, recently in, in Highlands and Islands, one of the issues certainly has been the growth of, of dementia and the effect that has on staffing. Uh, but the hard reality, without naming any establishments, um, is that uh, it's the chronic shortage of staff which is uh, thrown back to me when I've ever raised this. So. I can't speak for the organisation I visited, but certainly having sophisticated tools is all fine and well. And from a much point of view, that makes a lot of sense. But the hard reality is trying to fill the rota week in, week out is the main problem many managers face. Is that clear in your experience as well? Absolutely. At any, at any point, we would be running between a 7 and 11% um, vacant rate in terms of our staffing. Um, and we're pretty good at recruitment, so um, and that's I'm talking about Turning Point Scotland specifically. So um, there's a chronic requirement for staffing, and um, it feels risky to um, make that more difficult for us to meet the base requirements. Uh, mm. yeah, um, CCPS, along with the HR Voluntary Sector Forum, carry out an annual benchmarking survey looking at a range of workforce issues, and recruitment and retention is always the questions are always asked around recruitment and retention. And the 2017-18 survey showed that 93% of providers stated that recruitment is difficult or very difficult. Now, that's an increase from 87.5% the previous year, and it's also supported by the Scottish Government Commission survey in 2016, looking at the social services workforce in Scotland, which stated that the majority of providers find recruitment challenging, either regularly or occasionally. 
Uh, Andrew Strong and then Karen Hitch. I just wanted to come in on the back of that about a uh, future um, threat as well around Brexit um, in terms of the social care sector. Um, BBC research that came out this morning uh, said that there's 26,000 people working in health, social care or in public administration um, from uh, the EU. Um, and I think, uh, I think we should see that wider context as really important in terms of the social care sector. A lot of people um, work in the social care sector. Um, and the ability to carry on business as usual um, beyond March next year could be um, threatened by that. I, um, I think it's worthwhile having a look at the SSSC workforce data report that was released last month. Um, I'll draw your attention to, it says, with regards to the recruitment and retention crisis the sector currently faces, the SSSC workforce data report published a stability index of 77.1%. What that means is about a quarter of staff roles are changing in a year. Um, now, our own research at Scottish Care also shows that within six months, more people leave, of entering the sector, more people leave than enter. Put those two together with an increased demand, that is a huge crisis that we're currently facing. Um, you alluded to the vacancy rate in your own services. I also want to highlight that um, within, for nurses in particular, the vacancy rate is currently sitting at 32%. Um, it, it can't continue, and I don't know if you're aware, but last, there was last week's headline news for 19 care homes have closed this year because they can't recruit nurses. I have Brian Whittle and then Bob Dawes. Yeah, good morning to the panel. Um, and our evidence that uh, we've, we've heard and in, 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 in writing, the suggestion that the, the NHS in, in the UK and in Scotland is actually uh, very efficient, but that efficiency in itself is making the system uh, more fragile. And I wondered, does that apply in the care home sector uh, as well? Um, and are we, are we starting to work right at the boundaries of what we would term safe staffing? That's a challenging question, clearly. <laughs> how, how fragile is the care home sector? How um, robust, to put it another way, how robust are staffing arrangements currently? Karen, I think I would merely reiterate the statistics which we've just described. You know, we're really, really struggling to recruit staff. So if, when efficiencies are made, um, that's often where they're made because we're already at the bottom line in terms of resource for providing the service. There is nowhere else that we can lose um, funds. In addition to that, because of the nursing, um, the 32% vacancy rate around about nurses, uh, you'll see there's been a growth in agency nurse provision uh, of some 18% in the last year. Now, just because there are more nursing agencies doesn't mean that there are more nurses. Actually, what it means is that some of our providers were having to spend up to £1,200 a night to get a nurse. So, yeah, efficiency is not really the word, word I'd be using in this context at this point in time. Okay. Catherine, we're um, I suppose also what, what providers are trying to do is be more creative and dynamic, use multidisciplinary teams, um, and so that, that is the kind of counterbalance in terms of the, the crisis around staffing. Mark Just to pick up on that... Um, one, kind of the ambition of the legislation is to try and create a framework that spans diverse settings, multiple professions, integrated services, and team working. Um, and that's, that's good. Uh, I'm not clear that we really have the evidence-based approaches to, to, to ground that in at this stage. And I think there's a risk that in trying to do that, we create rigidities, um, that we end up with... Um, tool which isn't sufficiently flexible, um, that this can potentially become an obstacle to the sort of integration and innovation that Catherine's just mentioned, which are really the responses that the sector has when it's facing um, the workforce pressures and the recruitment issues that um, Karen's just described. I think that's one of the risks and unintended, potential unintended consequences of the legislation. Okay. Brian Riddle. Yeah, thank you. With, with with that in mind, um, I wonder if the panel think that, that, that the bill will support the, the sustainability of the sector you know, in, in terms of quality and safety. I think I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, as it was alluded to earlier by my colleague Dave Stewart, around the different sizes of, of uh, 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 in the care home sector and, and uh, 
are the tools are tools therefore applicable across across the whole of the care home sector speaking to maybe the, the, the tension between numbers and service you know are, are we are we talking about the wrong thing here are we talking about numbers when we should be talking about service actually what we should be talking about is the people who access care and support um, and making sure that we deliver care that's responsive to them and actually is led by them and um, when we start to think about tools then what you're doing is you're applying a prospect a prescriptive set um, of skills around that person which doesn't necessarily take into account their individuality um, sorry there was another aspect to your question what was it could you remind me it's just the the, 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 uh, the tools applicable across uh, the care sector as a whole is, is following on from, from Dave Stewart's line of questioning and that uh, does that in itself create its own tension? Um, I'll take you back to the multidisciplinary teams questioning around a bit innovation um, in their current setting. No, they don't and that would need to be taken into account. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Alison Christie. I think that um, you, one of the concerns that we had was, to, you know, could there be a standardised tool that would um, suffice across the diverse range of services. And on speaking to the bill team, the answer to that was no, it's unlikely. There will be multiple tools probably have to be developed, which again brings its own challenges. And someone asked about um, how many people do workforce planning. Again, from our um, benchmarking survey, only 23% of respondents use workforce planning tools. So we then have the issues and the challenges of people having to be trained when these tools are developed and not just trained in the use of a single tool, but perhaps multiple tools that will have to be used by the same organisation, which brings us on to the point of there's no clear indicator of how any training would be resourced. Yeah, OK. Bob Doris. I find it really helpful to understand the concerns that exist around this, but right at the outset, I think Karen Hedge said the current tool that exists, the IRM tool, and I'm not going to actually explain the algorithm <laughs> uh, around that, uh, there's, concerns over the, there's, there's concerns over the tool that's currently been used. So I wouldn't be asked the question another way. I've listened carefully to all the challenges. Any tool or tools that could be developed would have to be suitably flexible, take into account the varying needs and the diversity of the sector. But if we could get it right, would it be a positive thing? All those caveats, I suppose what we're trying to get around, if we could get this right, if we could get this right, would this be a positive thing for the sector? So workforce planning tools in principle, assuming that they are the right ones. Karen there Hedge. Are oh, there are positivities around about having tools in terms of transparency and offering guidance. Um, so I would... So, you know, Scottish Care would support having them for those reasons, but they couldn't be, you know, the be-all and end-all. There would still need to be a human judgment as a significant factor in there, which could override, you know, the, the tools themselves. We also need to bear in mind, as you say, the changing landscape. What we haven't discussed, and I'm not sure the committee re discussed it last week, was around about changes to technology um, and the opportunities they off that offer, actually, because it allows our staff to just be um, care homes are not clinical settings, they're somebody's home by the very definition, so it, you start to enter into a, a quite a grey area when you're trying to apply something from a, that was created for a clinical setting into somebody's personal place. Could I just reword that slightly before Mr Haleswood comes in, because it might be helpful. Um, would, and Karen Hedges said the constraints about on the ground, even after once you have these diagnostic tools to see what the skills mix, the workload should look like in any place, there has been on the ground judgment. If there was a degree of flexibility on the ground with these diagnostic tools about what headcount should look like, what the skills mix should look like, what the workload would look like, would that be helpful? <coughs> but as long as you had on the ground, that final judgment had to be made because you know your local care home setting best, for example. Sorry, Mr Hazelwood. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll come back to that. But I, I think let's uh, assume that we've got this series of perfect tools. I think there are still issues. And I think for any um, well-managed service, obviously a consideration of um, matching the workforce to the needs of the service and as we've heard particularly increasingly making sure that that's a personalized process so that we're trying to achieve the individual outcomes from an individual person that's that's got to be part of the process of um, running a good service 
I think there's a question about whether that's best done through making it a statutory requirement. And so just to come on to say that, I think there are issues about the statutory context into which you place such a tool. So one of the points that we've made in our submission is that um, there's a lack of clarity um, about the duty that's placed on commissioning authorities uh, when they're commissioning um, services. Um, they have a duty um, to have regard to the duties and principles placed on care service providers. Um, and it's not clear how that will play out in practice um, when commissioners are trying to achieve a, ballot, a balance of quality, um, safety and affordability. Okay. And, and that really takes us back to the wider pressures in the sector that we've talked about. Um, when the IGBs, for example, as commissioners are under great financial pressure, and even when service providers have a sufficient financial envelope um, to be able to fund the sort of workforce levels that are required to deliver the service, um, they're going out into a labour market where there just simply aren't the sufficient people to meet the needs. Um, and significant concerns and in all likelihood if Brexit um, proceeds as currently seems to be the case, mm. that those pressures will be severely exacerbated. Okay. Anyone else got an opinion on those points? Um, essentially the point that Bob Dodd has made, are, are tools of themselves potentially useful or are they simply the wrong way to approach the issues that you face? Anyone else want to address that? Catherine. I find it hard to imagine them being particularly helpful um, in this context. Um, I don't see how they would fit particularly well and I think until we're at a position where our um, resourcing, um, our uh, availability of nurses and, and social care workers is much, much improved. I don't see how useful that would be. Okay. Bob, did you have a follow-up? A very final question. I think it's particularly important given the concerns that were raised that the power contained within Section 3 in the bill is to have the care inspector develop a tool rather than implement a tool and I think that's an important distinction to make because maybe they can't get it right but I know that but given the, 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 the issue Mark Hazel would, would made in relation to recruitment, retention of staff and Karen Hedge said something similar I know it's in section 3 one thing that the government's not taking the power to do is to report on staffing levels does that seem a bit odd do you think as part of this um, the, the reporting and staffing levels nationally so we get a national picture and see what's happening across the sector across the country would that be helpful or would that just be an administrative difficulty for for individual care homes in the sector andrew strong uh, I, well from our perspective i think we would like to see something like that uh, whether that is, uh, whether that works for providers or not is, is, a, is another question i think from 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 the the people that we've spoken to, they would like more transparency about the pressures that, that um, uh, social care and, and, and health services is facing at the moment. Okay. Thank you very much. Sandra White. Sorry, oh, I, was Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to come in that because the SSSC um, already collect, collect some workforce data, um, as does ourselves and CCPS. So there are other means to, to getting hold of that data, although obviously a national picture might well be helpful in terms of you know, planning for the future. Okay, thanks very much. Sandra White. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning. Thank you very much for coming in. Can I just go back to the very basics of why we're here, basically? We've had evidence, obviously, from other professionals, and then we're having evidence from yourselves and others as well. The whole point with you is health and care, and that's important to mention, that the Health and Care Scotland Bill. Uh, and from what I'm hearing from yourselves and from others as well, it feels that basically we've got so many different aspects of this bill and it's really based on uh, RCN nursing, which is at the top, and then it's working its way down. You may not think that, but that's certainly what I've been getting fed back. And I think the complication is um, there's so many different sectors here. You've got the private sector, you've got council sector, care homes, etc., etc., and... I just wondered if you can answer me that honestly if you like, if you're not involved enough in it. But what I seem to feel is that this bill applies the same general duties on all the providers, and whilst they provide you know, varying uh, levels of not just care, they're completely different, uh, the organisations. Uh, do you think this bill uh, will actually succeed in 
creating coherence in the context of uh, integration, legislation, or practice between health and social care. Mark, Mark Hazelwood. Um, even if you come stay quite close um, to that core, as you've described it, of, of the applica consistent application of um, nurse workforce um, planning tools, there are some challenges and complexities which I think are not reflected in the bill. So, for example, um, a major provider of inpatient specialist palliative care provision in Scotland are the voluntary hospices. Um, now, amongst the broad range of services that hospices provide, I mean, they provide inpatient, most of the care that hospices provide is provided in people's homes, um, but they do provide inpatient um, services. And several of the healthcare services um, which are listed, the types are listed in Schedule 121C of the bill, um, where the bill proposes the application of a common method. The locations listed in the same table do not clearly equate to hospices. It seems to be predicated entirely on NHS um, settings. Um, so that's, I think, a complexity that we need to understand better even before you get to the, um, the wider um, orbit of um, the huge diversity of um, health and care settings of, you know, um, the other colleagues here have spoken around. And I think also there shouldn't be a blanket assumption that tools which have been primarily developed in and for the NHS can necessarily be applied with adaptation to other healthcare settings, for example, the, the voluntary hospices. Thank you. Anyone else? Have you on that? Uh, I can't hear you. Hi. Um, so in terms of integration, I don't think the bill in itself would add anything. There's already work going on around about that to develop new models of care. The Chief Nursing Officer's Directorate recently had a meeting um, specifically drawing on um, examples of local change that's happened in terms of thinking how can nurses potentially work peripatetically, looking at enablement programmes, things like that. So there is already work going on to do that. Um, if anything, putting the bill in place might create actually a barrier between the two sectors um, because there's a potential for um, nursing staff in particular to move into the NHS um, from the, the independent and third sectors um, in terms of terms and conditions. Where we already have workforce you know, in crisis, that, that's a problem. Um, we really need to be focusing on those new models of care and um, linked up career pathway, pathways, um, looking at multidisciplinary teams and, and other opportunities that we're currently already looking into. Keith Brown. Uh, I'm aware that four panel members have mentioned the um, impact of Brexit, especially in relation to recruitment and retention. I think vacancy rate at 32% was mentioned. There's been an increase, substantial increase in the last year. Stunned to hear that uh, a cost of an agency nurse is £1,200 uh, a night. I wonder how much of that goes to the nurse. But um, on the issue of Brexit, I know it's not as simple as those that are from the EU potentially leaving, there'll be other impacts as well, but are, are any of the panel members that have raised this able to give any idea of EU nationals leaving, having contributed to this over the last year or even in the last two years? And this is in the context of what's in the bill and, and, yeah. and the workforce planning uh, proposals. Any particular angle? Mark Hazelwood. I don't have the, the statistics in front of me, but I happily submit something after the meeting because I know there's um, a growing body of evidence about uh, the impact of the prospect of Brexit and also I think some of the um, evidence which has been published um, by the government in Westminster in terms of uh, economic projections raise concerns as well. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah, just on whether it's due to Brexit or other issues to do with recruitment and retention, is it not possible um, bearing in mind what's been said about being able to apply professional judgment, which is possible in terms of current tools used by nurses. Is it not possible that one of the potential benefits could be if you're able to get point to an objective, evidence-based and statutory uh, necessary process to commissioners to say this is what you require in terms of staff, that might be something which might help in relation to the point that Mark raised about commissioners being aware of their obligations as well. 
you could point to these tools and say, well, we need to have this, and you can take that, and, and everyone will be in the same boat, you can take that back to commissioners. Karen Hedge. Hi, that's one of the reasons that we've been looking at this as part of the National Care Home contract negotiations. So um, Scottish Care, COSLA, who um, will be appearing uh, after us, and um, Scotland XL are involved in that conversation. Um, with the you know with the proviso that it acts that the tools act as a guide, they're not a prescribed formula. Um, so the guess there are advantages, but you know as Mark mentioned earlier, that commissioners are not included in the bill is a, is a huge oversight. If they you know we could see this in the the Scottish living wage, where there's a requirement and, and absolutely so you know we should be paying our, our staff and we should be valuing our staff, um, but if that funding doesn't come down to the providers then they were put in quite a sticky position of having to then be able to pay that out. And I would hate that if this bill, you know, created that same draining resource or potential draining resource that that would, ha you know, repeat itself. Okay. Anybody else? Mark Hazelwood? Um, just a point, it's kind of a related point, but it's really that um, it's going to be really important uh, as this proceeds that there's some really clear linkage between the development and uh, of the models and the regulatory framework. Um, and I think that's also where the relationship with the commissioners comes in, because what ends up being very difficult is if there's an expectation on the part of the regulator that um, the provider um, will meet a certain set of requirements um, in terms of, of, of workforce, uh, but that in the commissioning process, um, there is an adequate resource to uh, to meet that, and the comeback in that position very may is very often at the level of the provider. Uh, we may suffer through um, poor ratings from the regulator, um, and that's really what I was talking about when I mentioned this issue about okay, what duties are placed on the commissioning authorities in those circumstances? Understood, Alison Christie. Yeah, it's just to add to that, you know, um, CCPS members. On average, 77% of their income relates to publicly funded services. So it's a huge concern for CCPS members that there's no duty pay, uh, placed on commissioners. Okay, important point. Miles Briggs. And thank you. I wanted to follow on from Keith Brown's question because I wanted to look at sort of workforce planning and training with the National Workforce Plan, which is now turned into three. And what feed back have you had with regards to future training in the college sector? Um, it's quite clear that the care crisis and staff crisis we have didn't start with Brexit. It's been over many years now building up. So what sort of future projections are you trying to look towards um, as meeting in terms of staff recruitment? And given the fact that the bill will have two speeds with the care sector very much in the slow lane in terms of this bill, um, are you concerned that there's unintended consequences of staff being poached to some extent to fill acute setting problems in the future around the staffing bill as well. Going out. Absolutely, yes. Um, and it's part of that. The One of the risks of, of the bill is the, the unintended consequence of being resource driven. So if you're trying to, to meet numbers of staffing, then that's where you put all your resource. Um, and if, they, you know, if the, the health part of, of the bill is, is introduced first, that means that more resource will go towards getting people employed there first, which means, yes, we are likely to lose staff, and that's a real concern given the figures I quoted earlier. Alison Christie. I think just a further concern again for CCPS members. Very small proportion of members have care homes, so we are that's then we are third in line for any resources. If they initially go to health, then to care homes, then services that are delivering community support will be under-resourced as a result. Catherine Reynard. Yes, we would be concerned that we would um, have to divert staff um, from one service to another to focus on care homes. And is it, is it fair to say our college sector isn't actually meeting our demands at this moment in time as well. I know the Scottish Government are currently um, looking to meet their policy around childcare. And I know from conversations I've had here in Edinburgh, where half of all delayed discharges, that so many new potential students are actually looking and being encouraged to go into childcare. So my concern is in, in regards to adult care, us not actually being able to meet these future demands and actively uh, creating unintended consequences of encouraging people to choose different pathways, which never then gets them into an adult care career. 
Does the panel have any views on, on that specifically? I think that um, the difficulties in getting people into adult care are also long-standing. And we are quite optimistic that the National Health and Social Care Workforce Plan, the national campaign for marketing, will address some of those challenges. But I think there's a long way to go to make adult social care attractive to people. And CCPS and uh, the voluntary sector actually have a recruitment working group. And we've been trying since May to get 10 people into an employability programme. And it's people who have multiple barriers to employment and are long-term unemployed, and they're not seeing care as an attractive career prospect. So I think there's a lot of challenges to be addressed um, beyond the bill. Okay. Um, Catherine and then Karen. It's about long-term education around the careers in social care, and um, at the moment there's just not the, that approach. Uh, so um, that starts at the very beginning from people's view uh, at school as young people, um, seeing it as a potential option. Um, and our, um, our, our joint uh, voluntary sector working group around recruitment has shown um, how people are really not choosing it despite being um, welcomed, um, offered that, having all of the approaches that you would have um, to entice folks into it. Um, so it is really, really difficult. Comment. Hi, um, my colleagues Catherine Ross and um, Paul will be better able to put something in writing in future, but what I can tell you is that there are concerns around about the way that the current um, the current training is, is put in place, whether that be you know SVQ models or whether that be through uh, an uh, apprenticeship. Partly this is because the majority uh, of the workforce, or the median age of the workforce, is currently 48. And with the changes to regulation and therefore an increased requirement for more qualifications, um, those people often have come into the sector not having qualifications, uh, have dual caring commitments. We know that they access training um, between the hours of 10 o'clock and 1 a.m. in the morning whole host of concerns around about that, which, if you would like, it would be helpful, Catherine and Paul, could put something in writing. That, that, that would be helpful indeed. Yeah. Th thank you very much. Yes, Andrew Spong. No. Okay. A, a number of you have commented on the potential for the bill to skew attention towards resources. Can I ask you, on the other side of the coin, is there any way in which you think the bill assists in increasing a focus on outcomes for individuals? And if there's not, perhaps we should hear that as well. What, 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 is, what is the view of panel members on the outcome focus within the legislation as, as it stands? Catherine Reynard. I don't see the outcome focus in the legislation as it stands. Mark Hazelwood. I, I think we already have the health and social care standards which provide a really nice framework for outcome focus. Understand. I agree with that. I, th I think one of the things that I'd like to see in the bill is more of a reference to how people with uh, who use um, social care or use health care on a regular basis can be involved and consulted in um, adding their voice to this. I think uh, that there is a reference around who's going to be consulted in the development of the tools, but I think there's, it would be legitimate to extend that to people with long-term conditions, disabled people as well. Yeah, I agree with what everyone said so far. The bill was not outcomes focused. Karen Hedge. Echo that. Okay, thank you very much. That's clear. Um, David Torrance. Thank you, and good morning, panel. With the care inspector being both the regulator of registered care services in Scotland and the scrutiny and improvement body for social work, do the panel think the care inspectorate is the appropriate body to lead on the development of staffing methodologies for care home sector? Karen Hedge. Obviously, the care inspector are very experienced in this area, um, and I absolutely believe they should be involved. We have a very close working relationship with the care inspector. Obviously, we need to, and that has resulted in um, you know, the majority of care homes in, in Scotland having good or very good ratings. Um, but I don't think they should be doing it in isolation. So to collaborate is not the same as to co-produce. The tools need to be fit for purpose. They need to be easy to use. You know, if our staff are 
running from place to place, given if we think about what the impact of the, the future projections on staffing shortages, that is a high potential for that to happen. They need to be able to use the tools quickly, easily, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if tools were to be produced, the care inspectorate can lead, but it has to be done. They must be co-produced. Andrew Strunk. I think it, I think one of the interesting things, and we talked about the um, national care standards and how they were developed, and that was very much in co-production with providers, with people who use support and services, and and with other bodies. So, you would, I would imagine that the care inspectorate would see the value of doing that and would take it forward in that way. So that I think we would be supportive, but with the caveat that, again, as Karen said that would need to be in co-production with, particularly with people who use support and services and providers. Okay. David Torrance. Um, will the bill change the relationship between the care inspectorate commissioners and providers? Anyone have a view? Do you think there'll be any conflict <laughs> interests there? What's the potential impact? Yes, yeah. cutting edge. So I previously alluded to, you know, the relationship that we have with the care inspectorate, and I would like to see that continue. I guess concerns arise around about the potential risk of ha creating a resource-driven um, service, where we have to put all the resource into staffing as opposed to that outcomes-based. So I, I don't see that it would change the relationship in in any great sense because. We already do co-produce things. We work together, you know, in an outcomes-based way. Um, I guess, in terms of reviewing our submissions, my only concerns, and I, said, I mentioned this earlier, was that we approach this very much from an asset-based model. Um, but in their submission, they refer to um, dependency tools. Um, I imagine this is something we could explore with them. Um, but that's the only place I could see us as coming up against each other. Okay. Anybody else? I'll, I'll listen, Chris. I think there's um, perhaps not changing relationships, but there is potential for conflict. You know, if the care inspectorate have developed the tools and are um, regulating against them, then there's no duty on commissioners to actually meet the requirements that the tools evidence. That's where the conflict could arise between the care inspectorate, the provider, and the commissioner. Mark Hayesward. Um it's not a direct answer to the question, but just to, to raise the issue that for the voluntary hospices, um, some of them have dual regulation at the moment, so some of their services might be regulated by the care inspectorate, but the bulk of their services are inspected and regulated by Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Um, so there's a degree of complexity <coughs> in a whole area of work around that. Um, because Healthcare Improvement Scotland doesn't have the same um, inspecting and regulatory um, relationship with NHS services, which it does with independent healthcare providers such as hospices. Um, and so we would need to make sure that when we come to the detail of um, how this all works through, that there is an, a, an appropriate uh, way of taking whatever models um, um, are developed, and some of some of this is specified in the bill in terms of types of healthcare service and types of setting, and make sure that that um, doesn't feed into Healthcare Improvement Scotland regulatory processes in a way which is a hindrance um, or has negative outcomes for the provision of services by the independent hospices. Um. My next question is about recruitment, especially in nurses in the, the sector. Um, it was mentioned earlier there's a 32% vacancy rate um, and an 18% growth in agency nurses. Can the bill in any way affect the recruitment and retention of nursing staff within the sector? Karen H. Uh, it very much will in the sense that because it will be done in a progressive manner from one sector to the next, so from health into social care, it will have a, you know, there's a potential for the consequence of social care losing staff into the health sector. Other than that, the bill in itself cannot, and I keep referring to this, it can't magically create nurses, you know. Um, and as much as there's a whole load of other going, work going on around about that in terms of increasing the number of student nursing places, et cetera, et cetera, new models of care and so on, the bill in itself will not create more nurses. Alison Christie. There's also the unintended consequence 
if you cannot find the staff anywhere that the tools uh, require you to have, what happens to that service? You know, the risk is that the service will have to close. Is, 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 there, a, is there a risk in all of this that a care inspector, for example, reports that a particular provider is not uh, delivering against the uh, workforce level set out or deduced from the tool, possibly doing a very good job in every other respect, but therefore uh, at risk of attracting a very negative inspection report with potentially serious consequences? Is that a real risk, Mark Hazelwood? I think that might be a risk, and I think that I can imagine a circumstance in which that happens despite the fact that the provider organisation is delivering on outcomes that are important for its clients. So the bill, having no outcomes focus, will potentially be in conflict with practices or policies within providers that are outcome focused. Is that essentially the point? Catherine Wainwright. Yes, that is the point, yeah. yeah. Yes. And we're in a real current positive position as well because of the recent changes to the care inspector, its methodology. It would be really good you know, to see where that takes us because it's, it's creating conditions for innovation and improvement and, and that real outcomes focused approach to, to bring this in alongside it just seems completely contradictory. Are you almost saying this is the wrong time? Maybe, yeah. It's, it's, it's fixing things in, in, in statute and freezing them in time as opposed to offering opportunity for innovation and change. The financial memorandum, policy memorandum around the bill say that it doesn't inevitably follow that there will be tools devised for care homes um, and likewise with hospices and other settings which are not specifically identified here. Uh, is there a logic to the bill itself that will drive the development of those tools, do witnesses feel? Is that a risk there? In other words, you create the mechanism to devise tools. Does it then follow that tools will be devised? Karen Hedge. We were already looking at developing some sort of tool um, under part of the National Care Home contract, but very much as a guide and to offer that transparency in, in terms of commissioning and so on. Um, but absolutely within the context of flexibility and not being burdensome um, and being on an opt-in basis as well. So um, it doesn't need statute to make this happen and statute could potentially limit where we go with it. But if statute comes forward, would you want to see that tool that's being developed uh, put in place rather than something borrowed from the NHS? It would need to be developed for the sector and co-produced by those of us who um, work in the sector. Okay, Brian Whittle. Just following on from your question, I just wondering whether the, you feel the bill should or, or, or could uh, cover all uh, sort of care homes, because uh, it seems to me we're just talking about currently the, 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 sort of, uh, the sector in terms of the caring for the elderly. As much more as has already been indicated to the sector than just that. I mean, can can, can we deliver develop tools that, 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 that deliver to that sector? Catherine Wainwright. I think you'd be need to look at multiple tools. Um, so it wouldn't it certainly just wouldn't be one. It would have to be um, a range of options probably, um, and those options would have to be quite flexible as well. So I don't see one tool doing that for the dynamic and range of services delivered. Can I just follow on from that? Does that then lead? There's obviously like within the bill. Is there is there uh, is there scope then for the the, the training that will be required uh, to, to deliver these tools on the ground? Because there have to, there has to be a, 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 an application, a cascading uh, of that knowledge into the into the care sector. Is, is, is there a, is there room in the bill for that? I don't I don't see that in the bill. I think. Um, I mean, any kind of training in the in a tool would need to be um, cascaded down through organisations. Uh, it would have to be applied correctly for it to work. It'd be quite dangerous being applied without the training. Um, so it would certainly be a requirement, um, and we would need to ensure that there was capacity for our, all of our services to be able to, to do that. Okay, thank you very much. And a final question from Bob Doris. 
quickly, um, it's self-evident that if this tool does progress, there's going to have to be a huge bit of re reassurance, a lot of co-production, a lot of flexibility, a lot of justifiable variation on the ground. If, if, if this is that, I mean, that, that self-evident based on the evidence we've had today, but one of the really interesting aspects of the discussions around uh, training of nurses and training of so, so, social care staff, um, if this tool does come in, um, maybe imperfect, but if it does come in, should it automatically trigger an annual review based on the data that comes out from that tool in relation to uh, training places for nurses, the FE sector? So it's not enough to say, here's a diagnostic tool that gives you an indicator of how you deliver a uh, workforce on the ground and a skills mix on the ground. Is the next step that the Scottish Government would have to use that data on an annual basis to tweak and develop its nursing training places and its FE provision and its university provision according to whatever that data shows. So should there be a next step to follow from this in terms of the, the training of it? I know that there's issues to get the people to fill the post in the first place, but if we can get them, do we have to uh, find ways of having this impact on how we take forward training in the future? Catherine Wainer. Yeah, absolutely. If the tool goes forward and there's um, valuable data, then we should definitely use the data for national workforce planning as opposed to individual service or regional. I mean, we need to look at the, the whole picture. I suppose one point to raise, however, is um, that it's, it's not so quick. So, for example, with nurses, um, although you might see very quickly that we need nurses in the sector, uh, it, and you may train more nurses, um, the kind of nurses that would be used in our settings need to be quite experienced. They're not usually straight out of university um, because it's a very responsible job. If not solo, maybe two nurses may work together, they may work alone. So there will be a time delay. So it is about um, using the data, but also thinking about it in those kind of time scales as well. Okay. And girls? Okay, well, can I say thank you very much to all of our witnesses. That's been a very helpful session and we've certainly gleaned uh, uh, some very useful information. Uh, we will adjourn briefly um, uh, uh, and resume uh, three minutes past in order to hear from our next panel. Thank you very much.
And uh, we will now resume uh, our meeting and uh, resume with our second panel of witnesses this morning. So um, it gives me pleasure to welcome to the committee uh, John Wood, the uh, Chief Officer for Health and Social Care at COSLA, uh, Stuart Bain, HR Business Partner for Health and Social Care Partnership uh, and Fife Council, representing the Society of Personnel and Development in Scotland, Dr Jane Kellogg, Head of Social Work Strategy and Development Social Work Scotland, David Williams, Chief Officer Glasgow City Health and Social Care Partnership, and Eddie Fraser, uh, the Director of East Ayrshire Health and Social Care Partnership. Thank you very much for attending this morning. As ever, uh, questions and answers through the Chair, and we will have about an hour for this evidence session. So can I start with a question I asked to the witnesses in the previous panel, which is how far witnesses believe this piece of legislation that we're considering today uh, is focused on outcomes for uh, users of services. Perhaps start with John. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so as is hopefully clear from our, our evidence, COSLA is not supportive of uh, the, the legislation as it stands. And one of the reasons behind that is because we see the bill very much as being focused on inputs uh, rather than outcomes. Uh, so though staffing numbers necessarily aren't um, mentioned or detailed within the legislation, it certainly appeal, it appears that that's the way in which the legislation would head and, and the way in which uh, tools would head. Um, I suppose reflecting on the, the previous session, which I was here for, there's nothing in the bill um, that we can see, nor in the uh, necessarily the policy memorandum supporting it uh, to um, to demonstrate that the outcomes are at the heart of uh, of the bill uh, or are at the, uh, at the heart of the intention of the bill. Okay, thank you very much. Stuart Bain. Um, echoing, I think, what John's just said, um, I guess our concerns are around the uh, qualitative issues rather than quantitative issues, particularly if you think about the care inspectorate. Um, auditors by their very nature will audit to whatever they are asked to audit to. So if that involves counting heads, then that's what they will do. Um, and it's probably easier to count heads than it is to measure quality. So there is that kind of imbalance in terms of you know, the objectives we would like to see, which would be high quality uh, care services and perhaps an excessive focus on you know, simple tools to, or not so complex tools to measure uh, capacity that don't always capture the whole picture and actually manage to get down to the qualitative outputs that would be of interest. Thank you very much. Jane Kellogg. Yes, I would agree with the previous speakers and uh, those at the earlier session today. Um, I think in terms of outcomes, we're already um, in a, a legislative, primary legislative environment that um, in terms of integration that uh, partners are working towards um, more outcome focused approaches, looking at innovation across the sectors. Um, I think the, the sector is adequately regulated currently to allow for, um, for scrutiny over our, um, our uh, uh, processes and procedures. Uh, and I, I don't think this bill um, lends itself towards um, an outcome-based approach in that current integrated context. Thank you very much. David Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the, the, the public bodies uh, Joint Working Scotland Act clearly sets out nine national health and wellbeing outcomes uh, that integration authorities are expected to work towards achieving. Uh, and I think the very fact that that piece of legislation explicitly sets out that that legislation is about outcomes for uh, individuals and uh, communities is significant in itself. Um, and uh, I think that the, there is a very real potential uh, it seems to me with this draft proposal that that actually mitigates against being able to deliver on those outcomes because, it, as colleagues have indica indicated, it's, it's very process orientated. Thank you very much. Eddie Fraser. I, I suppose in line uh, with my colleagues, I would echo, you know, the policy directing has been about shifting choice and control to individuals around more self-directed support, you know, around more, more self-management. I suppose there's a bit of a concern if we go down a line, you know, of regulation, particularly around, you know, like one, you know, profession, that will that take away from some of the innovation and some of the policy direction uh, that we've uh, been been working uh, towards. 
you know, I also think, you know, the Health and Social Care Workforce Plan that's already agreed, you know, between Scottish Government and COSLA gives a sound basis in terms of the responsibilities of what we need to, to take forward at this time. Okay, so here a clear view in relation to outcomes. Is there a, any respect in which the legislation as it stands assists with workforce planning either at a local, a service level or a national level? Uh, uh, and if not, is there other legislation which might assist uh, with addressing the workforce issues that uh, the uh, services that you represent face? David Williams. I, I, my own view, I think, is that the, the, there is sufficient um, uh, a framework in place through legislative and policy direction uh, and, and infrastructure to enable uh, integration authorities and health and social care partnerships partnerships which have the uh, substantially lead responsibility for commissioning uh, health and social care provision, not within acute hospital settings, but certainly in, in terms of community uh, and some inpatient uh, provision. Uh, uh, that is, and, and that infrastructure and existing framework is already in place and, and, and sufficient uh, to allow and enable the level of, I, I think, innovation that uh, my colleague Mr Fraser has uh, hinted and uh, alluded to in relation to why integration of health and social care is, is, is in place. It is to transform uh, the planning delivery uh, receipt and experience of health and social care services across Scotland uh, and any legislation it seems to me that that needs to come f that that is uh, proposed to come forward uh, subsequently including this legislation should be about enabling that process uh, rather than making it more challenging. Anyone else? Eddie Fraser. Again, just to build on that, I mean, clearly we have a number of, of workforce tools out there, you know, particularly the, the nursing workforce tool. I think it's interesting that that was, you know, developed by the profession, you know, in terms of how that, that's been brought forward, you know, rather than regulated, you know, to find that. And so it's not, I think, that anyone's saying that we don't think there should be clear focus around safe staffing across what we do. But I suppose it's just the bill as it is just now seems to actually very focus on a particular profession rather than how we in this new integrated world actually work across that and right out with the services that we manage into the third sector, you know, and into some of the choices people may want to make through self-directed support. So some of the workforce tools that have been developed in nursing through the profession, I think do give clarity and assurance, but at the same time, you know, it's how we see that across and, you know, again, going back to, I think the vehicle that can be, you know, the, the health and social care workforce plans. Okay, Jane Clark. Yes, just, to, just pointing out that the Public Bodies Act is still relatively new um, and the integration joint boards and the health and social care partnerships are feeling their way, I think uh, would be fair to say in, in this particular um, context. The focus very much should be around outcomes, around self-direction, um, working in collaboration with service users to redesign services in an innovative way. Um, it, it seems to us that the, that the bill as it stands really does not lend itself well to that, um, to that agenda, that it's uh, at the very least premature uh, in relation to, um, to, f to furthering the, the concept of integration. Um, there are some gaps as well, I think as has been mentioned earlier on, um, a lot of the focus is around the NHS um, services. I think that uh, has the potential to have an unintended consequence of skewing um, the focus uh, onto the NHS uh, to the detriment of social care. One of the gaps that Social Work Scotland has, um, has uh, found in the bill that um, that the bill covers um, regulated social care services and not social work services in the wider context. So um, as the bill stands at the moment, it doesn't include public protection services um, that are on the ground working in highly uh, complex situations um, within, um, within communities across, uh, across Scotland. And our um, real concern there is, is the bill as it stands um, the, the resource implications will, will be focused around um, uh, health mainly, social care secondary and uh, social work not at all. Stuart Bain. Um, I would draw attention to the regulatory framework that uh, uh, local authorities in particular work under with safeguarding addressed through the prevention of protection of vulnerable groups legislation which is excellent 
um, the work that the Treble SC do in terms of ensuring workers are proper, properly regulated, are properly qualified, um, and have achieved the, the, the correct levels of uh, CPD, for example, and the inspection regime under the care inspector, which again, in my experience, does tend to focus on uh, qualitative issues. So I would say, you know, those safeguards are there and shouldn't be uh, ignored. And John Wood. Thank you. Yeah. So on the specifics of your question as to whether um, this bill or other pieces of legislation give us what we need with regards to workforce planning, I think that um, part of the answer to that would be to look towards um, the National Workforce Plan, which is co-owned by COSLA and the Scottish Government, which is obviously a non-legislative um, piece of work. And I think that if we're talking about strategic workforce planning, so looking at where pressures in the labour market are, where re recruitment and retention are, are under pressure, I think that it'd be safe to say that legislation doesn't offer any clear benefits in that regard, but some of the um, some of the kind of softer approaches, the benefits that can be brought by that national workforce plan, I think are perhaps where uh, our, our attentions might be best diverted. Okay, thank you very much. Um, to follow up, uh, uh, Jane Kellogg's response, particularly in regard to social work, uh, David Stewart. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, convener. I'm particularly interested in raising some issues around social work, not least uh, that was my first job, albeit that was many, many years ago. Um, I'm particularly interested in the issue around the exclusion of non-regulated social work staff. Some of them, my questions, uh, have already been covered, um, but particularly perhaps to Dr Jane Kellock, the issue around the Public Bodies Act 2014, which you re referred to. Is this issue of being excluded not contrary, then, to the Public Bodies Act of 2014? I think when we look at um, integration, we are looking at the potential to have um, non-regulated social work services. I mean, the, the, the staff are regulated in terms of the SSSC, but the service that they provide is not one of the services that the Care Inspectorate um, regulates in its, um, uh, as, as a service. What, what I think local authorities and NHS um, are looking at across the board at the moment is where frontline um, statutory services can come together and work in a more integrated manner in order to improve outcomes for service users. Um, so, so looking at the bill as it stands, it very much s separates out uh, social care from, from health. Um, there isn't a sense there that... Um, there is any future proofing around what any new models of support might look like, either at the at the care side of the equation or at the frontline public protection um, part of the of the social work and indeed health uh, business. Um, so, so, so as as I said, I think at, at the moment the bill as it stands doesn't really reflect what the integration authorities' um, role really is is about. <coughs> So, effectively, what you're saying is there's a bit of um, muddled architecture in terms of the legislative hold and what we're talking about in the future. Yes, I think so. And, and Social Work Scotland's taken a, a, a quite a nuanced approach to this, um, opposing, if you like, the legislation as it stands, but taking a pragmatic approach that if the legislation is to go ahead, then we would also wish to see social work services included in the, in the legislation and not excluded um, per se. Do any other panellists that you could have like to contribute? Eddie Fraser. So, in relation to, to social work services being included, I just think we need to point out how complex an issue eh, that is in terms of it including social work services. Social workers work as part of a team around people, so teams around a child, around a family, around an older person. So actually the context of regulating social work actually depends on the local context that you work in. So if a local social workers don't have a multidisciplinary team around them, you would actually need a lot more of them. If you've got adequate teams around a child and teams around, you know, like, you know, communities, then actually you might need less social work. And that's where it becomes really difficult. How do you regulate for that? How do you regulate for the local context of, of where it would, would be? So again, you know, like, it is about, about how we look at the whole team, how we look at the local context, not just social work, not just nursing, but actually the totality of that. And some of that can be right out with our realm into, you know, like our teaching, you know, colleagues, etc., and how they are actually, you know, responding in local communities. Anybody else? David, did you have a... Yeah, I um, just generally, there, obviously there's concerns being expressed by panel members, albeit in different, different ways. Um, 
there was some hints, uh, I think, from, from Jane about the legislation could be improved. Do the panels have suggestions about this? Because um, obviously their bill can be amended in future uh, stages. Uh, any suggestions for how this uh, legislation be improved? Because that's obviously our job as members of this committee. It's a very general question. Um, so uh, succinct answers would be appreciated if there are... Uh, thoughts on that? David Williams. Yeah, Chair, sure, thanks. I'll have a, a go at that one. Uh, I, I think, uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, less is more, uh, it seems to me, is, uh, is the response to the, the comments that Mr Fraser has just made uh, uh, in, in relation to uh, the legislation. And, and I, I do think that uh, the complexity of arrangements that need to be uh, often put in place in order to deliver on protection of children or protection around vulnerable adults, uh, or even, dare I say it, in relation to MAPA, uh, responsibilities, multi-agency public protection uh, arrangements for uh, individuals who present risk uh, in communities, uh, are unique, individual, complex, uh, and therefore it's difficult to uh, legislate for in relation to uh, staffing arrangements around that, regardless of, of the, 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 the sophistication or otherwise of um, uh, workforce tools. Uh, and it does strike me that if there, uh, the Parliament is uh, minded to proceed with the legislation, then uh, it needs to be uh, a legislation that should uh, absolutely have, have at its heart the uh, notion of uh, flexibility, responsiveness, uh, and, uh, and professional judgment, uh, as opposed to something that uh, becomes potentially a mechanistic tick box uh, uh, response. Okay. Anyone else? Stuart Bain. Um, the only things I would maybe add to that would be um, definitely the, the focus on quality rather than quantity. Um, uh, definitely a recognition that local conditions are um, very relevant to staffing decisions and that should be reflected in anything. And uh, the, the final thing I would say is around uh, in ensuring that um, actual workers are included both in terms of kind of consultation in terms of staffing arrangements and also in terms of uh, worker wellbeing, because I think that's important too. Okay. John Wood. Thank you. I suppose I would um, it's incumbent on me to start off by saying that we didn't think that the legislation should cover social care in the first place. That's something that our board uh, members were, were um, at pains for me to come, come and express. I think I would certainly reiterate the point about professional responsibility not quite being reflected in the bill. If we were to look at improvements, um, I think that's an area for attention. I also think that... Um, I, I'm not necessarily sure what local context refers to uh, in the bill as it's, it's listed as a, a principle to consider. Um, but I think that it would be really important for the, um, for the, the tool, at least, that's developed uh, as a result of this bill to, to take consideration of um, the challenges in workforce supply. And I know that we're, we've been touching on that this morning and, and probably will later this morning as well. But if there's something that works in isolation of... Uh, the, the fact that it's simply difficult to re recruit people uh, into these roles um, and that the tool and the legislation doesn't uh, take consideration of that, then then it's a real challenge uh, at, the, at the very first hurdle. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Sandra Hart. Thank you very much, Chair. I wanted to come in on the back of perhaps staffing or, or that, and um, I'm really quite concerned about what, what I've heard. I would say possibly, certainly me and others here, um, our constituency caseload is really social work and uh, care homes and um, perhaps bed blocking and that type of thing. So I just wondered when we heard evidence, um, previous evidence, not this morning, but the week before, it was basically to say that, yeah, it was nurse-led, RCN-led, but they wanted to create this tool where if they could prevent bed blocking if they were able to see they needed more nurses in that respect. Do you think that's went far enough? I obviously, listen to what you're saying. That's a good idea if it would work that way. But have uh, social work and social care been involved enough and in how that will fall down in actual care that you get in you know, the community? Have you been involved enough? Coming from the top, it sounds great. You will have this tool if you're short. You can get more nurses there and perhaps prevent bed blocking or, or reduce it. But has anything been done in the, the lower aspects of it, which is really where the people are, are getting cared in the community and care homes as well? You know, if this bill had to go ahead, have you been involved enough in, in your sector? 
who would like to start? John Wood? I suppose the fundamental point there is that we, before the, the bill was laid in Parliament and, and the, the, the policy was kind of announced, we weren't aware of there being any appetite for this legislation and I think that's fundamental uh, to bear in mind. So in terms of kind of co-production of the legislation itself, we've had conversations with officials after the announcement of uh, the fact that there would be a safer staffing bill uh, introduced into Parliament. Um, but in terms of the appetite, it wasn't really there. I, I think that we have um, received good reassurances that the tools would be co-produced with uh, the care inspector and would certainly hold them to that if, if the tools come to be produced. Um, but uh, yeah, I think in terms of uh, co-producing the, the, the notion of the legislation itself, then that, that hasn't really been there. Okay. David Williams, then Stuart Bain. Thank you, Chair. If I went back to the uh, uh, integration agenda and, and the outset of the legislation, I think the perceived wisdom was that it was substantially in place to address the issue of bed blocking and delayed discharges. It's a lot more than that, and I think it's proving to be a lot more than that, than that and I would want to uh, stress that uh, really uh, strongly. However, in saying that, uh, the, the, the attention that health and social care partnerships across the country have uh, been asked to uh, focus on in relation to the delayed discharge agenda is significant. Uh, and partnerships uh, up and down the country are responding differently and, and variably re related to local uh, re uh, uh, issues and, and locality needs in terms of how to uh, expedite and improve position in relation, in relation to the delayed discharges. Um, and, and I think that the innovation and creativity that comes within the legislation and the integration arrangements uh, uh, facilitates that. Uh, and, a, and an improved picture, and I think the p picture has uh, has improved certainly in terms of uh, significant reductions in bed days lost uh, across uh, the country in the acute hospital sector as a consequence of that. Uh, if if you were to if which I think your question alluded, if we had more of X, Y, and Z, would we be able to deliver a, an improved performance again? Uh, arguably, uh, yes. Uh, and, I, and certainly in the community, particularly around uh, the, the, the uh, increasing levels of frailty and, uh, and need and, and acuity of need uh, of uh, uh, significant numbers of the population uh, in their own homes and how they can be better supported to remain in their own homes. Uh, but would this legislation assist that? I don't know that it would, uh, because, uh, because as I said before, I think it comes back to uh, the uh, people's unique circumstances uh, and their own particular individual needs and how the, 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 the array of support around that individual could be brought to better bear uh, and, uh, and, and improve uh, impact and outcomes for that individual. Okay, Stuart Bain. Yeah, I think um, I was going to give an anecdotal, anecdotal experience from um, my health and social care partnership where the fact that we were able to be flexible has actually reduced um, delayed discharge. We're able to shift social workers from a community setting to working in hospitals to uh, help in the um, uh, identification of need. We were then able to change our focus within some of our care homes so that we've got uh, basically enablement bed sort of arrangements where people move into our care homes for a brief period of time to get them back on their feet, back able to care for themselves. And our focus within uh, care at home has also changed so that we're moving to an enablement model where a, a short term intervention um, uh, targeting uh, carers to be able to help people to go back to independent living again has meant that um, we're able to move people out of hospital. We quite, we, with that, that flexibility has allowed us to be quite successful in the last um, 18 months or so in reducing the amount of delayed discharge we've been experiencing. So very much an illustration of what David's just been talking about there. Eddie Fraser. There are two areas I would focus on. You know, first of all, we're an area that are very successful at taking people home and, 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 and appropriate. So delayed discharges as such isn't a, a huge challenge to us. Our number of people attending hospital and being admitted to hospital is a challenge to us. And you know, so our, our investment over the, the next couple of years will be very much in that in the community to prevent people actually attending a hospital and being admitted uh, in the first place. So we'll invest, you know, between the money for primary care and additional money for intermediate care and rehabilitation, ten million pounds over the next two years to actually try and support people at home rather than actually attend uh, the, the, the hospital. The other area that I would point out when you actually talk about capacity within 
care homes to support people with maybe complex needs and be discharged. I mean, it's well known, and John and I spoke at an event a few weeks ago around nurses within our care homes, and there's a real challenge, you know, in terms of that sector and actually recruiting and retaining nurses within the care homes, so much so to the point where the care inspector at times has had to go in and work bespokely with care homes and actually work out, so what does a nurse actually have to do and what can senior social care workers actually contribute to that? So given that that level of flexibility is required around some of the issues around, you know, like staffing within care homes, I think any legislation would need to be very careful that didn't cut across the flexibility that's having to be, you know, exercised just now to make sure that the care homes can continue to, you know, operate effectively. Okay. So can I just a follow up onto that? Because it was interesting when you mentioned about nurses, you know, obviously very difficult to get them into to care homes. Uh, the previous panel had mentioned the fact that most nurses at work in the care homes are over 40, 45, 50, etc., and they're very experienced. But when we heard from other RCN and others, it was basically about getting nurses through university and brought into that. So, how you know how will that affect it then? Do you think? Because it, is it you know is it right that they are all you know 40, 50, and more experienced? And it's it's more difficult to recruit that type of nurse. So, so yes, you know the, the answer is it does tend to be, you know. So if you look at uh, our community nursing staff and, and staff who work within care homes, obviously they're working, you know, usually when I say unsupervised, they're working on their own, you know, out there. So so they do need a whole level of experience to be able to do that. Often, our more senior nurses in care homes are also the manager, you know, of the of the care home. So many of these nurses do come up through you know, like our hospital system and then come across it. So they actually grow within a protected environment within a hospital system uh, and come through. We, as, as a partnership, again, we're just about to take, you know, um, nine uh, graduate nurses and actually try and work with them in partnership between our um, practice nurses and GP practices and, you know, our, our community nurses to actually see how we can have a development role to have, to have a younger cohort of nurses, you know, coming through, you know, that they're younger as in when they're uh, qualified uh, coming through there as well. But you're right to say that is the age profile of our, our, not just our care home nurses, but our community nurses and staff as well is that mm -hmm. age profile too. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank Thanks. you very much. Uh, Bob Doris. Thanks, convener. If the take-home message with the last panel uh, kind of social care providers was the need for flexibility and professionalism and f professional judgment making, if there is to be this uh, tool uh, brought in, certainly already we've heard from David Williams and Eddie Fraser, uh, a take-home message for me anyway is it, ha it, hasn't, it can't be a banner to innovation, to reform and to restructuring. And I think Eddie just outlined some of, some of that there. But when a lot of my constituents think about uh, safe staffing levels. They think about hospital wards and they think about care homes for the frail elderly quite often uh, with multimorbidities and um, Alzheimer's or, what, or, or whatever. So I just focus on, and there's a bigger picture, and Dr Kell hinted at that bigger picture quite clearly. But can I just talk about that for a li little bit? If I didn't ask this question to Scottish Care, but it might be a question for Mr Wood or Mr Williams or Mr Fraser. Had I said to Scottish Care, are you content that the National Care Home Contract suitably remunerates uh, care homes in the third sector uh, on an equitable basis with care homes that local authorities run in terms of safe staffing and levels and all those outcomes you want to see. Would Scottish Care be happy with that, do you think? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we should really be asking other people to speak on behalf of Scottish Care since they've just left us. Um, but uh, uh, well, there, well, is a, there is a more general question well, well, there, I guess, ask, about... Well, let me about ask it another way. I think okay, the point I'm again. making is that I know from local care home providers and other care home providers contacting me over the years they have got issues with the National Care Home Contract. They don't necessarily believe that it's equitable to third sector providers. They've, they've said that in the past. They believe there's preferential treatment uh, given to local authority care homes. Um, I don't know whether they're, they're, they're accurate or not when, when, I, when I'm told that. There's a negotiation that goes on between COSLA, the Scottish Government and, and, and Scottish Care. Um, so back on to the idea of this tool. How do we get transparency into a system without some form of diagnostic tool that takes into account the workforce, the skills mix, the workload, yes, the individual circumstances in each care home, and I get all that, in a way that myself as a politician can go, 
yeah, we've, we've got that right, there's transparency there. We are properly financially remunerating the third sector in care homes without a robust, agreed statutory tool. Okay, does anyone want good? to answer that question? I mean, in relation to, obviously, what's in front of us in the bill. John Wood. So, um, I think that the, uh, the interplay between this and the National Care Home contract is certainly one that we've been live to, and, and my colleagues at Scottish Care would, would say that as well. Um, questions about the, the, the rate that the National Care Home contract produces, I suppose, or maybe for another day, but it's safe to say that we, we work really closely with Scottish Care at the moment um, to, to reform the National Care Home contract and to arrive at um, a rate, certainly from, well, from next year onwards, um, that, that's evidence-based uh, and that, that we believe is sustainable. We, we believe that we got a settlement that was along those lines for this year and and, um, and that from next year onwards that will be the case as well. In terms of um, that point about bringing transparency to um, to, to staffing levels and um, I suppose the funding that, that follows that, I think that there's, this, there's a specific question about the National Care Home contract uh, and uh, rates within that um, and it, uh, there's been a discussion about a capacity or capability tool being developed as part of a reform of the National Care Home contract. That conversation has ha actually happened kind of in isolation of the uh, the legislation that we've got in front of us today. Um, I don't think that that necessarily needs to change but I think that further down the line it's really important that uh, when the care inspector at, at working with the partners across the sector come to developing these tools that, that it's really important that the care home sector and, the, and probably the national care home contract further down the line needs to really inform what that tool looks like and, and the two need to be aware of one another. David Williams. Thank you. Uh, really just to say as, and reiterate what I said before, which is that I believe the legislative and regulatory framework for uh, the provision of, of care in uh, care home environments in particular, uh, in this instance, is, is already in place through the care inspectorate and the, uh, the, the um, standards for care uh, that are set uh, at Parliament. Uh, and uh, those, that regulatory framework applies uh, in exactly the same way to the private care home sector, the voluntary care home sector, and the uh, provided care home sector uh, within uh, local authorities. There is no difference uh, in that respect. Will the bill make any difference to how uh, commissioners commission care from the different sectors? For example, local authorities, integration authorities. Will it make any dif Will the bill make any difference to how you commission services, Eddie Fraser? I think you know one of the, the things that's been pointed out in a number of, of the submissions is if we do go down you know a, a line where part you know of our workforce, our nursing workforce, and say you know within you know adult care homes is regulated uh, around legislation, and other parts are not, then it can skew your commissioning. Because we would have to commission into the areas, and there might be other areas of our business that weren't regulated that, that we couldn't commission for, and that would be a real risk for us. Because it might be some of the areas that I spoke about earlier in relation to the prevention agenda and stopping people, you know, needing some of the services. So again, it's the complexity of only, you know, um, looking at, at one part, you know, of that. In terms of what we're paying, you know, John spoke about, you know, that the you know, the national care home contracts, and I think that's important. I do think it's also important to continue to reflect that the good work that's been on recently around the Scottish living wage and making jobs within social care, particularly care homes, you know, able to be recruit and retain into the jobs, because it has been a real challenge for us in terms of continuity care for the residents. And I think we're seeing a change in that, and I think that's a positive thing. David Williams. Just very briefly, I think the, the, there's a lot of concern expressed through uh, a number of the submissions around about the financial uh, uh, availability, if you like, or viability of, of providers uh, and provision. Uh, uh, if this legislation were to go ahead with insufficient resources, either coming through the commissioning bodies or from uh, central government in relation to, to towards funding it. Uh, and it does strike me that if we are tasked in integration authorities to commission uh, innovation uh, and changed and transformed services, we would rather do that as a consequence of something that's been done by design and well thought out and well planned, rather than as a consequence of a business failure. Okay. Brian Whittle. You know, good morning, panel. I just wanted to follow on uh, from, from something that Bob Doris says. I, I, in, in taking uh, evidence in these panels, uh, innovation and flexibility are words 
that continually we brought to the table, and it didn't take long uh, for those words to arrive here. And I think, certainly in context of the fact that you know, recognising the pressures nationally on the workforce, and therefore, you know, the, the reliance on a degree of uh, flexibility um, I, I, and innovation. Um, I wonder where the bill sits uh, in terms of being able to continue to deliver that, that, that innovation and flexibility. And I wonder if I could ask specifically about the third sector, because uh, as SCVO stated, you know, there's, there's, there's 40,500 people within the, the, the third sector there, a huge variety of organisations and different sizes of organisations. So I wonder if does the bill take that into account and, and what the possible uh, sort of ramifications of, of this kind of legislation on there? Lots of questions in there. <laughs> Jane Keller. It, it, it's difficult to see how the legislation could take account of all the different sectors, um, all the different service provisions across the third sector and the public sector in any meaningful way that isn't already covered by uh, existing legislation. And we also have Fraser. Just again, you know, the particular areas of the, the, the bill, you know, at present, in terms of, you know, the nursing workforce and in terms of the, the care homes. I mean, I would say that the majority of our third sector operations are out there in the community in, in terms of what, so, so actually just now it doesn't encompass a lot of the work that we certainly commission off the, the third sector, you know, so it, right now, I don't think it is, you know, like, uh, you know, doing that. that I recognise there are third, third sector organisations who still are in the care home business, but the vast majority of the third sector actually work in the communities with people in their own homes. So uh, I think it would have limited impact across the third sector. Okay, anybody else? Would, Brian, yes. Just, the bill, bill has the, the, the potential to, to reduce the need for agency staff. I think that, that, that's a key element there. And does the financial memorandum maybe take into account the potential requirement for extra staffing uh, you know, in, in terms of to comply with the legislation? Two, two, two questions there, I think. Will, will it increase or reduce the need for agency staff and what are the wider financial implications? Uh, Stuart Bain and then John Wood. Um, I think I would just observe that um, we try very hard not to use agency staff at the moment and it's not driven by um, uh, better workforce planning it's driven by the fact it costs us more um, we don't use agency staff unless we actually have to and um, the use of agency staff is really driven by two things one would be local market conditions and the second would be the kind of work that we are able to offer um, so local market conditions, we've, it's been talked about all morning, I don't need to go back into that. In terms of the actual um, work that we can offer, um, you know, if we're able only seeking somebody for a couple of shifts or to cover you know, one you know, night shift or something, um, that isn't a job for somebody. And while we do have a pool of casual workers we can call on, um, that's quite an insecure form of work and it really doesn't suit many people. So quite often what people might be seeking would be to register with an agency where they know they're going to be able to pick up work from a whole variety of different providers. And that then means that um, they're not available for, for um, permanent employment by ourselves or anybody else. Now, you know, that's kind of an inevitable um, part of the way um, care is configured. You know, care isn't delivered in nice nine to five packages um, that suit everybody. It really depends on you know the needs of the service user, and that means that we have to deliver care at different times when it doesn't you know necessarily suit people's working patterns, and that's really what drives the use of agency workers. I would say, rather than you know not being able to plan for the workload per se. Although I mean, as an HR professional, I'm really keen on workforce planning, so you know I think it is a good thing to do. It's just it's maybe not what drives the use of you know casual workers have a bad name in terms of employment practice, agency workers have a bad name in terms of expense, but we don't use those because we haven't thought about it, we use them because the kind of need uh, derives that. John Wood, followed by Derek Wood. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, so on the first part of the question, um, reiterate Stuart's point about the fact that agency in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, in, in terms of would the bill reduce our dependence on agency, I think that um, 
I think that we don't know, and I think I don't know if the evidence has been presented um, that it would have an impact on uh, the use of agency staff. Uh, so that's not necessarily to, to kind of shrug at the question. I think that we need to look seriously at whether or not the bill adds value in that regard, and, and certainly from what we can see, um, there's, there's no evidence to suggest that, that it would help to, to reduce our dependency, if it's a dependency, on agency. In terms of the second part about the financial implications, um, yeah, we, 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 we were concerned about the financial implications. We had a, a commitment from the previous Cabinet Secretary, which was welcome, that the Scottish Government would meet any additional financial burdens. I think for us at the moment, our um, concern is that we don't know what those are, and they're not simply about um, the fact that the, the tool, the statutory tool, might result in a need for more staff, um, but also the fact that there will be a resource demand created by uh, the need for to, to train um, service managers and, and planners, workforce planners, up on uh, the use of the tool. Quite a significant resource, perhaps, if, especially if we're talking about the number of providers. Um, that are involved, and also um, just that, that strategic capacity um, on an ongoing basis once people are trained up in the use of the tools uh, is, is something that would, uh, that would be a resource demand on, on commissioners. David Williams. Chair, I'll only be repeating what uh, the previous speaker said. Okay. Uh, Keith Brown. I just ask, it seems pretty clear from uh, CAUSA's um, submission and what's been said today that CAUSA opposed the bill and C uh, can't identify any benefits arising from it. I just wondered in relation to Social Work Scotland though, again your responses today suggest you had a similar position, but your written submission did seem to suggest there was maybe some areas of amendment. Is that like you think it can be improved or you just think it's not, it's not worth doing that? I think our, our position is um, similar. Our first point of our position is similar to that of COSLA in that, in that we, we would not support primary legislation in this regard. Um, there's uh, sufficient uh, legislation already in place, as, as we've said before, in secondary legislation and guidance. There's the new standards, there are the, um, the, the workforce planning uh, guidance that's come out, all of which supports safe and effective staffing, and that's the main position that Social Work Scotland takes. I think it would be fair to say, though, that, that a pragmatic approach should the bill go through, and, and, one, and the point that, that Social Work Scotland really is making in, in the submission is that it, it, um, the, it, the exclusion of social work services from the bill could result in an inequity in terms of resource allocation. That's our, that is our um, main uh, concerns in terms of unintended consequences, that the focus goes on um, staffing up in terms of numbers, the pursuit of, of tools that may or may not be effective in the context that we are talking about here, including community contexts, um, the, the diversion of, um, of focus and activity around that rather than on um, pursuing the, uh, the legislation that we have in place around integration, around SDS, all of these things are areas that, that require our consideration in, in, in terms of developing approaches that meet the, the requirements of those um, pieces of legislation. And it seems to, to us that, um, that the focus on the, 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 the bill as it stands really um, doesn't, it, it kind of crosses over the, the main purpose of the other pieces of legislation, which seems seem to us to lend themselves well to us pursuing a more outcome-focused approach uh, and um, perhaps moving towards more of a community social work type approach along with our partners in the uh, in the public and independent sectors. Okay. So in, in short, you would rather not have the bill, but if the bill is going to happen, you would rather it was Indeed, even yes. handed. Miles Briggs. Thank you, convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, in the evidence you submitted, um, I was interested by some of the unintended consequences which we've touched upon uh, this morning. Um, specifically, there was a point raised with regards to if this is the case, um, implementation would drive savings in areas uh, to move to areas which are covered by the bill. And I just wondered if you'd like to expand further on that. Um, that was specifically from East Ayrshire. Um, and then from Glasgow, there was also um, a second point with regards to concerns that the legislation will add another process and pressure on the system. Um, and so I just wondered if you could expand around how you see these unintended consequences affecting 
uh, your specific areas. Okay, start with Eddie Fraser and then David Williams. So, so I think I touched earlier on the specific part. So if we are regulated around one of our, work, you know, one particular workforce or, or nursing workforce, then clearly that's regulation and, you know, what we'll require to invest to do that. And that could skew what we're doing in terms of working as a team, in terms of our allied health professions, in terms of our, our social care staff, in, in terms of the amount that we might want to invest, you know, in the third sector for our community connector type link workers. So if you've got one part of the business that's regulated and you're required to invest in that, then that's what you do. You know, you don't see it as alternatives eh, across. When we recently went out, you know, and, and done the work in terms of recruitment around our intermediate care and rehabilitation, we were quite flexible. There was a range of different professions that can actually support people as long as they're working as part of a, a team. And some of that was around, you know, what is the available workforce to make an impact just now? So what's the balance between our nurses, our physios, our occupational therapists, some of our senior social care workers that we're bringing uh, together? If you've got one part regulated, our concern is that then you are required to do that and it reduces the scope to do um, flexibility in the rest of the multidisciplinary team. That was the specific point that we were trying to make. Okay, good. David Williams. Thank you, Chair. And just to add to that, uh, I think there is something also about the, the emphasis on the legislation being on substantially the high cost uh, uh, intensive level of provision, which is essentially hospital uh, and residential care. And if, uh, as Eddie has just highlighted, the level of investment needs to be in those areas, it's counterproductive and counterintuitive in terms of the general direction of travel uh, that integration authorities are expected to travel, which is to shift the balance of care and support more people in the community. So we end up perversely taking money and resources out of uh, uh, more upstream f provision in the community in order to continue and sustain uh, high cost uh, intensive uh, and institutionalized forms of care uh, substantially uh, to come to the particular reference in relation to the uh, the uh, other processes and pressures on the system inevitably uh, the experience uh, that we have uh, uh, I think in, in in the system is that if if we're required to do something then we need to be able to demonstrate that we are delivering on that uh, and that would require uh, processes and, and procedures in place and probably resources in order to count uh, the fact that we are uh, uh, not only delivering the required levels of staffing in terms of directly provided provision, whether on health or social care within the council side of the business, but also uh, amongst the commissioned uh, and procured uh, level of services that we are responsible for as well. That's, that's a bureaucratic burden that I think we could do without. Okay, thank you very much. Good. Is it therefore from what uh, you said to the committee, um, your belief that what we're trying to do with this legislation could destabilise or go against the spirit of what we've tried to achieve and are trying to achieve and have built a consensus on around health and social care integration um, two years into this process. David Williams. That chair as well. Um, I, I think, as uh, colleagues have uh, intimated, uh, from a, a range of reasons, I think there, uh, there, there is a potential to stifle innovation and creativity. There is a, pretend, there is a requirement and expectation that integration authorities will deliver on transformation. That can't happen uh, if there is a top-down, uh, essentially, a f uh, effect st stipulation that we, we must do X, Y, and Z in order to deliver something that, that is legislatively required uh, to deliver. I think the the previous point in relation to where uh, resource allocation might find its way to to being focused on is is counterproductive to uh, the the general direction of travel. So in short, yes, I think is the answer. Anybody else? On, on that? Jane Carrick. Uh, yes, ju just to to state our uh, agreement with that position. Um, these are our concerns also in Social Work Scotland. David Williams mentioned the potential to inhibit innovation and flexibility. Would any of the other witnesses wish to comment further on that risk of stifling innovation in general terms? Eddie Fraser. Again, you know, when we talk about innovation, and I will speak about, you know, the, the care home sector, you know, so some of the joint work that we are doing just now with the, the care inspectorate around care about physical activity is actually seeing much more integration of the care homes in the communities. So it's actually seeing staff and volunteers with the residents going out, you know, in, in the communities. And one of the concerns I would have around this 
is that going to you know stifle that? Is that going to be around? So you know, looking at the 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 numbers of you know uh, carers still within you know the, the the building, is it going to stop what we're able to do uh, in terms of some of that? I think we are becoming even in the care home sector much more innovative and thoughtful around self-directed supports. So it's not someone is just now going to a care home and living out their life there. They're having an active life in that care home and actually integrating more in uh, communities. And I do think, it, I mean, I need to always say, it's not that we don't think there should be safe staffing in every element of health and social care. It's about on the day, the manager being able to have control and actually say, yep, it's fine for one and one member of staff to go down the street with somebody because the rest of the care home is sitting there and it's stable, you know, like just now. So, so they're the types of things and, and innovation that's going on just now in the, the sector that I think we need to be careful that any legislation doesn't cut across. Jane Kirk. Yes, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, I, I do think that the current legislation that's in place, particularly the, the um, Public Bodies Act and the SDS um, legislation, these are both long-term um, matters, long-term issues, uh, fundamental change within what we do within the sector. Um, and it needs time to bed in. And I would say that we are still in, in the early days of, of really understanding what these pieces of legislation can afford for, uh, for us in Scotland, particularly given the very complex conditions that we have at the moment, that, as was mentioned earlier, around um, the, the population demographic, the um, the implications of Brexit, the whole uh, availability of workforce, etc. Um, I think that, that this this legislation is, is premature in, 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 in its placing in terms of, of what we already have in place in Scotland. Thank you very much. David Torrance. Um, with budgets under constant pressure, our anticipated costs associated with the bill on public bodies, the third sector, businesses, realistic, especially around tool and method development and staff training. Costings, uh, Stuart Bain. Uh, I just uh, there is an opportunity cost in any activity they undertake. So if um, care home managers are using a tool, then they're not doing something else. Equally, if you're asking your um, admin, your admin people or your HR people to do it, that will be taking time away from doing something else, be it working on safeguarding or, you know, better recruitment or whatever. So um, don't underestimate the size of the task. You know, a couple of weeks out of somebody's working year, even just one person can actually mean that something else is not getting done. Anybody else on the costings? OK. David, are you happy with that? Yep, I'm happy. Okay, thank you very much. In in the context of care as opposed to health, as a final question, is um, is risk a different concept in the care sector? Is there a a, a challenge uh, here? And does the bill do anything to help uh, in terms of supporting appropriate judgment and and, and uh, taking on of risk? Uh, maybe Jane Kellogg and then Eddie Fraser. Yeah. It's got in there before you. Um, certainly risk is it's a different concept when, you, when you're talking about, about care. You're talking about different settings. You're talking about, um, you know, in, in, the, in the NHS, when you're, when you're thinking about ward settings, it, it's very different to think about in the community where people have, um, where people live out their lives, really, and, and they have to be able to take... Um, take some level of risk in a managed uh, way. Um, certainly, as the way that the bill is set out, it, it really does nothing to um, to reassure uh, that that we, we will be able to, to, to do that in any meaningful way. Eddie Fraser. I, I suppose when you mention risk in, in social care, immediately what comes to, to my mind is risk enablement. How do we support people to actually live out their lives? How do we make sure that the, the things that they want to do we actually support them to do and that uh, you know that sometimes that does involve risk so whether that means in a care home walking across the floor to get your newspaper rather than somebody hand, handing it to you whether it means someone with dementia living longer in their own home where there may be risks rather than a care home because moving to a care home to a hospital is not risk neutral either eh, in terms of you know what we do so it's how do we enable people 
to actually take the level of risk that they're capable of doing. So I see it's a risk enablement thing in social care uh, in terms of what we're charged to do. And does the legislation impact on that in any way, in your opinion? I, I, only in, in the fact that you know it would be more rigid around, I think, what we, we can do. So, so I, I'm, I'm not sure that, that it does impact. OK. David it's just to say, Chair, yeah, that I think that uh, we need to be careful uh, with any legislation coming forward that it, it doesn't create the, the false expectation that we are removing risk uh, as a consequence of putting potentially more staff in place. And the, the example that Eddie's just given around uh, an, uh, an elderly person being encouraged to, to cross the floor to pick up a newspaper, uh, that, that, that level of uh, enablement needs to be uh, uh, encouraged and supported. Uh, but you may well still have uh, any number of staff and the person may still fall. Uh, and the, it's about how you allow people to live their lives. And I think we need to be careful that we're not trying to uh, limit and, and, and do away with risk in the provision of legislation. OK, and one final supplementary from David yeah, Stewart. Just a, a minor and arguably simplistic point. Do you, does any of the panel members draw any implications from the fact that the orig originally the bill was was paraphrased as the safe staffing bill, and I see that safe's now been removed. I'm not sure whether government lawyers have had a role in this or not, but is there any implications from the panel from the change of name? John Wood? I just think absolutely. to be perfectly honest. David. I appreciate the change of name, but the, the, the perspective that I guess is out there still is that it is and will be considered the safe staffing legislation. Uh, and and so there is an element of that already in play, regardless of, of what the final title might be coming forward. Uh, finally, finally, Bob Doris. Because I have a question we got asked in the last session about the iron tool for um, work, working out what what, what staffing would look like and some concerns are, around that. Um, I, I take fully on board all the points made about some of the significant concerns that have, all the witnesses have got in relation to, to, to aspects of this bill, but there was a feeling that iron tool has got some deficiencies in it. Is there a need for a new diagnostic tool in partnership with care providers and others anyway, irrespective of this bill? Just wondering. Stuart Bain. Uh, just a very simple anecdotal point. I spoke to our uh, manager who looks after care homes in Fife about how they assess staffing levels in preparation for this session. One of the things that she highlighted was that the tools they used, one of them is iron, the other is a uh, Fife Council tool called CPAC. They're good at assessing physical need and addressing staffing levels in terms of that. Um, they're not so good at um, assessing need in relation to cognitive behaviour. And as we are seeing increasingly fail, frail um, uh, residents coming into our care homes, uh, that is actually something that is that is more and more important. So the tool isn't uh, capturing everything that we need to uh, uh, be concerned about. Okay, and the last word, John Wood. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I don't have a professional view on the iron tool. I'm not familiar with it myself, but I do know that there are conversations going on between officials to look at either how iron could be improved or um, something else might be developed um, but I don't think that that's necessarily imminent. I think it would be months or, or years down the line. Okay, thank you very much and uh, thanks to all of our witnesses for another very helpful session. Uh, we'll adjourn briefly uh, and resume in a few minutes uh, with the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much.
much, colleagues. We will uh, now resume. Uh, the next item on our agenda is consideration of an affirmative instrument. And as is usual with the affirmative instruments, we will first take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary and her officials on the instruments. Uh, and once we have had all our questions answered, we will then move to a formal debate on the motion. The instrument we are looking at today is the Public Appointments and Public Bodies, etc. Scotland Act 2003 Amendment of Specified Authorities Order 2018 in draft. May I welcome the Cabinet Secretary uh, and our officials. Indeed, may I welcome the Cabinet Secretary uh, for the first time uh, since her appointment to this committee. Uh, congratulate her on her appointment. Look forward to hearing from her. May I also put on record the committee's thanks to her predecessor, Shona Robinson, uh, for her active engagement with the committee over time. Uh, and can I uh, welcome Jean Freeman, Cabinet Secretary, also Michelle Campbell uh, from the Workforce Leadership and Service Transformation Directorate, and Kirsten Simonot Lefebvre from the Directorate for Legal Services. Uh, can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement? Thank you very much, Convener, and can I uh, thank you for your um, kind wishes um, and express my pleasure at being uh, for the first time at this committee. I'm sure uh, we will meet again on many other occasions, uh, and I look forward to those exchanges and to uh, our continued uh, good work together, uh, building on the work of my predecessor. Uh, with respect to what is before you this morning, um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly to the committee about this amending order, which seeks to remove both the Scottish Advisory Committee on Distinction Awards, SACTA, and NHS Health Scotland from the remit of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life. The draft affirmative order applies, two distinct, applies to these two distinct public bodies. SACTA, as I'm sure members know, acts on behalf of Scottish ministers with regard to granting and reviewing distinction awards for NHS consultants. In 2010, in accordance with the Scottish public sector pay policy, uh, we froze the allocation of new distinction awards, and as a result, SACTA's duties have been limited to an annual review of current award holders, which has made membership of the committee less attractive to potential new members. In addition, the, potential, the pool of potential peer reviewers at the top A-plus level has also reduced, primarily due to retirement. These issues, coupled with the fact that other members have completed the maximum term of office, including extensions, has meant that SACDA has reduced its current membership from 14 members to five. By removing SACDA from the Commissioner's remit, we anticipate that a simplified recruitment process can be put in place to establish a board of seven to ten members. NHS Health Scotland is a special NHS board set up to improve public health and reduce inequalities. It will cease to exist as an NHS board on the vesting of Public Health Scotland, which will be achieved by the 1st of December 2019. NHS Health Scotland currently has a small board of nine non-executive directors, and it would be very difficult and not necessarily appropriate or proportionate to appoint new members to replace those board members whose terms complete before the end of 2019. By removing NHS Health Scotland from the Commissioner's remit, we will be able to retain appropriate membership and better manage the organisation's transition over the next 12 months or so of its existence. It's important, I think, before I conclude, to emphasise that both SACDA and NHS Health Scotland will still operate within the principles and ethics of the Commissioner and that this step is being taken only to deal with short-term issues of recruiting committee or retaining board members prior to review of the Distinction Awards and the abolition of NHS Health Scotland. And I am now, of course, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. I could also welcome the Cabinet Secretary to a new person to the committee. Um, in general terms, Cabinet Secretary, I obviously totally understand the practical reasons you're approaching this issue. Um, could, I can make some just general points. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary will be well aware, um, obviously the Commissioner uh, for Ethical Standards is a parliamentary body, uh, independent in its day-to-day -day activities, uh, but responsible to the corporate body, which uh, I was on, and Sandra uh, White is a current member for P and Rations. So I've had some experience of it from the other side, so to speak. In general sense, I think it's very important that we actually look at inc including or increasing the range of ethical standards rather than reducing it. 
Now, I totally understand there's some practical issues here, but the first point I want to clarify um, is, is that obviously one of the bodies uh, is going to be uh, concluding in a year's time. I understand Public Health Scotland will be taking over the new role. Is it your intention for Public Health Scotland to come under the remit of the Ethical Standards Commissioner, which I think is yes. very important, which obviously I would support. The second issue, whilst I totally appreciate government has changed and frozen the award since 2010, you'll know that Distinction Awards had some controversy in the past when they were better known as Merit Awards. Um, now, I, for one, obviously want to uh, thank our hard-working consultants and celebrate the work they do, and I understand that giving financial awards um, as one way of doing that. Um, over, over the period of uh, subsequent governments, there was a lot of controversy around Merit Awards, and it was felt that they weren't transparent and open. So the, the reason I'm raising some concerns is actually moving a body from the remit of the Ethical Standards Commissioner is not one I would generally support. I would go the reverse. I would be looking to ensure that transparency is there for every public body. So I do understand the reasons you're going for this, and I do understand that Parliament will have an opportunity to have its overall say. I just want to put on record the fact that I think it's very important that parliamentary commissioners are parliamentary and have a strong independent role. And I would be concerned in the future if government sought to remove any other bodies from the remit of the Ethical Standards Commissioner. And, and I completely appreciate the points, Mr Stewart, you've made and would agree with them. Um, as you say, this is entirely a practical move. On the uh, question of SACTA, uh, their current role, because we have frozen uh, the application of new distinction awards, their current role is to review existing mm -hmm. awards. And to do that, they, they do need to have A-plus reviewers, um, mm -hmm. and we have uh, experienced some difficulty in uh, recruiting those. Now, we've also indicated uh, that we will review uh, the position on distinction awards going forward and have begun discussions with the BMA on what, how, what that might look like to remove some of the controversial matters that surrounded the previous system and to see if there can be a future system devised that, that does give that recognition um, that you indicate you would welcome, uh, but is also fair across the whole of our health workforce. Um, as we do that work, we will, of course, keep this committee uh, updated on, on how that is progressing. And should there be uh, a, a future system for the um, application of distinction awards and not just the review of them, then obviously we would want to look at the role of SACTA at that point and would expect it to be uh, part of the Commissioner's remit. Good. Good. I remind members, this, is, this section of the meeting is re in relation to question, uh, questions and answers. Clearly there will be an opportunity to make debating points uh, once the motion is moved, but if there's a further question... Just a second point, and I appreciate this question is very difficult for the Cabinet Secretary to answer. Um, but if we assume then that the Scottish Association of uh, the Scottish Advisory Committee and Decision and Awards comes out of the remit of the Ethical Standards uh, Commissioner, and there is some future breach which would normally be dealt with by the Commissioner, who's going to deal with it? Well, the, we would expect the, the body to continue to work in line with the standards of the Commissioner. And if there was a breach, then we would take the opportunity, if we thought it was correct, to refer that to the Commissioner for their view. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Keith Brown. Yes, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, and I'm pretty sure this question is going to reveal the extent of my ignorance about this area because it's not something I've been involved in previously, but uh, I'll ask it nonetheless, and I'm sure I'll be schooled in this area. But I just wonder if, in considering this, um, proposition in relation to SACDA in particular, whether it's also been considered um, the idea of not having the body, and or if that's going to be one of the considerations as you go forward, if it's there just to review these um, uh, awards and no new awards are being made, is there another way that could be um, undertaken? I just wonder if that's part of the thinking that's going on or not. Well, part, part of the, the very early work that has begun is to have initial discussions with the BMA about the, the future prospects of a, an award system that met some of the intention behind the distinction award system, but in a way that is fairer across the whole health workforce, is more transparent uh, and, uh, in, uh, and more evidence-based. 
Now, that's very early days. Um, should we reach a conclusion that is satisfactory? Uh, we've already, you know, there has been a previous consultation on this and nothing happened as a consequence of it because no consensus could be achieved. Should we achieve consensus this time round, then there would need to be a body uh, to undertake the work uh, comparable to that, comparable to SACTA. That may be SACTA, it may be a revision of its role. Uh, in all of that, of course, um, this committee would be uh, involved and uh, its views would be sought and its uh, approval would be sought, in fact. Um, at the minute, so that's the going forward position. At the minute, the role is simply to continue a review process of those who, who currently have those awards. Um, my... Whilst I'm not clear, uh, being almost equally new, uh, Mr Brown, I'm not clear whether or not you could disband it. My instinct is, why cause additional fuss when you don't need to? Let the body continue to do the job that it is there to do, uh, but give us an opportunity in this practical step to improve the numbers of members it has on it in order to take forward that work. Uh, Good morning. Oh, good afternoon now, Cabinet Secretary. It's really just for some information. So the remit is now simply to review uh, distinction awards. I'm just wondering, what power does that entail? Is it to review and report to yourself, or is it to review and recommend? Because you review, just wondering in terms of the process, what happens with that review? It, it's to review and report to myself. My colleague, Ms Campbell, probably has a much better understanding of this than I do, but my understanding is once you have a distinction award, you have a distinction award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, um, I was wondering, in terms of the fact that these distinction awards have been frozen uh, for some time now, what assessment are, has been made around the impact that's had on attracting people to the health service, potentially? We know um, this is a global... Um, pool of people we're trying to often attract and in terms of um, them coming to Scotland to work we know the, the current um, shortages we have around many specialties um, has that been included in some of this work going forward especially um, with what you say is the work going few forward with the BMA and do we have a timetable around that review? So uh, in terms of whether or not it has an impact the fact that we have <coughs> increased the number of uh, consultant positions and are filling those does not indicate to me that it has had an impact. I'm sure the BMA may have a view uh, on that matter and we'll bring it to those discussions. Um, the discussions have uh, very, and are in very early days, uh, so there is not at this point a timetable for their conclusion. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, the policy note mentions that SACTA had three concerns themselves that uh, it should be continued, continue to be composed of both medical and lay members, that new appointments should be submitted for approval uh, by the chair and medical director, and the process should, should be transparent. Can you confirm that those uh, reassurances were provided and that the Commissioner for Ethical Standards uh, was also consulted? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, and the Commissioner was consulted in September, I believe, last year, uh, and has expressed himself content. Uh, and has, was also consulted in terms of uh, Health Scotland and is also content. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now, if there are no further questions from members, we will now uh, move to agenda item four, which is the formal debate on the instrument on which we have just taken evidence. I remind uh, members that uh, this is no longer a question session, so there are no longer questions to be put to the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officials... Uh, may not speak in this phase of the meeting, uh, but I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to move the motion S5M12935. Thank you very much. I move that the Health and Sport Committee recommends that the public appointments and public bodies, etc., Scotland Act 2003, Amendment of Specified Authorities, Order 2018, be approved. Thank you very much. Are there members who wish to uh, speak in the debate? If not, can I put the question to the committee uh, that the motion uh, be approved? Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. And thank you to the Cabinet Secretary and officials for their attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now move into private session for the concluding part of the meeting.